good at this time, as we are approaching a rather metaphysical phase of our subject, to try to understand a little more clearly uh, some of the psychic motivations which led to the gradual enlargement of the interpretations of the Torah and the severe books of the Mosaic Law. As you probably realize, there are in this world many persons by nature inclined to a mystical point of view. They arise in all nations and among all religious groups and in every time of history. They constitute usually a minority. For the most part, thoughtfulness belongs to minorities. And there is only a small part of mankind that seems naturally endowed for contemplative existence. Yet such contemplation does exist. And to a measure, perhaps, it is a matter of age. Youth is not normally of contemplative mood. But the elders, after they have passed those years of immediate concern about physical things, sit together in the twilight of their age and ponder not only the world they live in, but the mysterious universe to which they shall so soon return. Thus age is a time of contemplation. And this was more so in early days when the interests and activities of peoples were more simple and natural and less stimulated by artificial considerations. But it would not be wise merely to say that the thought of Israel was only the thought of its elders. For there are those who seem to be born of great age, and others, even in the course of years, do not achieve it. So we find among the Jewish peoples a contemplative group perpetuating itself from generation to generation, and even though scattered by the diaspora, still continuing in their own ways, not only contributing to a mysticism in Israel, but to a measure enriching the Christian and Christian mystic and the Muslim mystic. As a result of this contemplative process, the old Jewish mind sought in Scripture not only the letter of the law, but something of its spirit. And the sufferings of early Israel probably quickened this need in the consciousness of the people. Where troubles, worries, and fears gather heavily upon a tribe, the people of that tribe seek the consolation of the Spirit. They find words are not enough, even kindly words and good words. They seek for richer meaning, for broader interpretation. Also in the course of centuries, the letter of old law has a tendency to become obsolete. Matters which were of great interest at a certain time may lose their interest in future times. And it is not good to be in the presence of a sacred book that belongs only to the past, to ages dead and conditions no longer relevant. Yet the jots and tittles, the words and letters, cannot easily be changed. But man, by his own moods, can alter the meaning to his needs. Thus interpretation comes in, enriching tradition, 
and in turn enriched by tradition. And in Israel there has always been this mysticism. Come down from the prophets. Come down from the day when the judges judged in Israel. And Israel, of course, had a very peculiar type of spiritual teacher, a living prophet, a holy man walking with his brethren, yet divided from them because he had received the anointing power of divine insight. Thus there were prophets in Israel, men of vision, as in the story of the visions of Ezekiel and Isaiah. These visions were as of men picked up into an ecstasy, lifted up from the sorrow of the moment, whether it was the Babylonian captivity or the long period of waiting in Egypt or in the desert or in the scattering under the power of the Roman Empire. Thus this mysticism has to live. And this mysticism is not always welcome in the very place of its own birth. For mysticism always comes in conflict with the rigid dedication of orthodoxy. The mystic is always a kind of heretic. He frightens, he amazes, he even annoys those of pious mind. Therefore, mysticism is more apt to be persecuted by its own than by the stranger. And the persecution of Jewish mysticism is also recorded, though perhaps not to the same degree that early Christian mystics were persecuted. If we try to understand this situation among the Jewish people, we may see its parallel in the rise of Christianity itself. We find the early disciples under a very close relationship with the founder of their faith, and then slowly time passes. Little by little, the doings of Syria and the Roman Empire lost general interest to mankind. Mystics felt very sincerely in themselves that the human being cannot be consoled merely by history, even though it be sacred history, nor can he be redeemed by a biography, even though it be the biography of a saint. The need for a continual living faith was early experienced in Christianity, which fortunately was able to provide an excellent instrument in the epistles of St. Paul. For in St. Paul this mystical quality was already clearly manifested. And as one of the principal supporters of the early faith, Paul's position was relatively secure, though not beyond question, even to this day. But Christianity needed its mysticism through the Dark Ages, through the years of persecution, uh, through the strange, troublous times that threatened the survival of Europe, through the Renaissance, through the dawn of the modern world, and even in our Western Hemisphere where peoples went out into wilderness to create homes and to carve a destiny in strange, wild places. Mysticism was therefore a continuing meaning, something which enabled the person to immediately experience beyond the ordinary uh, teachings of his faith. Many sects have been born of mystical experiences, of visions and of dreams. These have played their parts, for in each instance they represent a struggle away from the limitations of literalism into a world of greater emotion, of greater spiritual satisfaction than could be found in the jots and tittles of orthodoxy. So we have this experience even today, where the effort to bring Christianity into focus in our present world crisis is demanding better interpretation, 
deeper meaning and the restoration of contemporary significance. These messages must be dislodged from the ancient wall of history. They must be brought directly to us to be a present help in time of trouble. So among the Arabs, likewise, who came in contact with the early Kabbalists and early Christian heretics who were cast into the de desert for their mysticism. And out of these various rootings and others still older, mingling perhaps with streams of Asiatic thought, the mystical sects of the Near East found their encouragement, inspiration, and substance. So we have the dervishes and the Sufis and the Druzes. We have all these strange melancholy points of Arabia. We also have the deep, strange, uh, subtle stream of East Indian metaphysics. Everywhere that faiths have come, men have been impelled by these faiths to draw something more out of themselves. And this which they drew, drew from themselves, they assumed to be the very substance of the faith they believed. It never occurred to them to assume that the interpretations were their own. These new interpretations were the real meanings, long obscured, long hidden, long misunderstood. So it is perfectly proper and right uh, that the old Jewish scholars uh, should have some concept of a mysticism particularly necessary because of the ritualistic, formalistic austerity of their orthodox thinking. It was not enough for the elders to sit together and gravely contemplate upon the sins of Israel. It was not enough that they should constantly reiterate and re-examine the structure of the Mosaic Law. It was not enough that they should try to expand the words of the Talmud uh, to cover every phase of human conduct. Something much more significant, uh, significant was needed, and that was the expansion of meaning to the consolation of spirit. <coughs> These people needed the warmth of a great mystical tradition. We do not know exactly when this tradition rose in the parallel structure of the Bible, but I think it is reasonably safe to say that it was present at least a thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era. Probably in the very early time, there was not as much need for it as later developed, but the foundations were already there, and the early students of Jewish metaphysics were convinced that their great mystical traditions descended from Moses, who had received not only the tablets of the law and the formal structure of Jewish religious jurisprudence, but had also received upon the mountain the secret and mystical instructions of God, that there was not only a doctrine for the mind but one for the heart, not only a revelation for the multitude, but a revelation for the few who gathered in prayerful contemplation of the great mysteries of life. The, uh, by this uh, passage, by this thought, we see that another constantly jogging factor was present. Every day in his experience of this world, man learns something new. Man passes through experiences his father never experienced. And as these changes come, he must find somewhere in his faith a place for the new. <coughs> if he does not, his faith soon becomes too small for him. He could not change the words, but he could ensoul them. He could discover in them this larger, deeper, and nobler meaning. He could find ways of taking obscure statements and twisting them to provide answers for situations that arose in his daily existence. <coughs> the, uh, 
these interpretations in turn became the basis of new orthodoxies. And the mystics themselves were revised and reformed many, many times, so that they became conservatives and liberals, reactionaries and progressives, even within the subtle structure of metaphysics itself. Perhaps one of the best summaries we can uh, call upon to straighten this situation to the average person is by contemplating the definitions and ideas of Rabbi Maimonides upon this problem of the metaphysics in, in Israel. This great scholar, who was the body physician of Saladin the Magnificent, uh, was quite convinced that contrary to popular belief, that there was a metaphysics among the ancient Jewish people. That there was a mysticism there, and always had been and as much as it arose in the very consciousness of Near Eastern peoples. That this mysticism was concealed from the multitude, and that at an early time, esoteric orders and secret societies arose among the Jewish people. And admission to these was by a kind of invitation only, and only those who were the most advanced, and the most comprehending, the most subtle in their thinking, the most dedicated in their lives, were ever permitted to share in what might be termed the secret doctrine of Israel. That this doctrine existed, uh, Maimonides was fully convinced. He was not certain, however, just exactly what areas it covered. He was inclined to suspect that the mysticism of Israel was concerned first with an effort to understand the invisible universe that part of creation which ascending from the spheres of the known and the comprehensible into the ever more attenuated realms of the divine uh, was populated in its own way by angelic hosts and archangelic creatures, by mysterious beings that never appeared in our mortal world at all, and that there was some kind of a magnificent universe far away in quality, but perhaps imminent also in value, wherein dwelt divine things, the roots, the keys, the sources, and the substances, from which illusions, shadows, forms, and mysteries are suspended into the physical world. Philo Judas, following the ancient uh, mysticism of his people, found that it mingled conveniently with the mysticism of Neoplatonism and the metaphysical systems of the Orthics and the Egyptians. And he even went so far as to suspect that perhaps this mysticism of the Jewish people originated during their captivity in Egypt. Probably, however, it was older. For such mysticism was also to be found in the valley of the Euphrates, among the ancient peoples of Assyria and Chaldea. This mysticism has always been, for there was always a point who went out at night and sat under the stars and tried to understand life. These points were the carriers of the mystic way, even as the troubadours, the point musicians of medieval Europe, perpetuated the mysticism of early Christianity. Thus, with the presence of this mysticism, we come into a series of interesting symbols. Symbols that have to do with more than one quality or condition. And we must first establish the meaning of a certain bridging. Uh, whereas in our modern way of life, especially in Western Christianity, we have been inclined to regard as God wrapped in a mystery, this spiritual source of ours, I think the old Jewish rabbis were a little more courageous. Instead of considering dear to be, deity to be simply inscrutable, never to be fathomed, that the laws of God and nature were beyond the understanding of man, that providence was something before which man could only bow and about which he could never question. This attitude does not seem to have prevailed so completely among these elder, elders of Israel. They really believed that if this mystical universe of causes existed, that if region and realm 
extended far beyond the visible and the knowable. That their prophets were lifted up, as in dream and in vision, and in some strange majesty of power, and were carried into these invisible worlds. That it was even possible for man to approach the very presence of God and return to earth alive, as Moses had done from the blazing crest of the mountain. These peoples seemed to feel that man could wander into the inscrutable regions of the divine abode, <coughs> that it was possible for man, as the beloved child of heaven, to come into his father's presence. And out of this came a, an interesting dual philosophy. And this philosophy centers around the symbol <coughs> which I think is of value to us, and that is called the Merkaba or Merkaba, the chariot of righteousness. This first appears uh, probably in fairly clear statement in the Bible in the vision of Ezekiel. And here suddenly a strange and mysterious vehicle presents itself to our consideration. It is a strange floating thing, different from any uh, structure man has ever conceived. It was full of wheels, and the wheels were full of eyes. And it was guarded upon its corners by the four cherubs, and their wings formed a throne. And in the midst of this strange machinery sat the Ancient of Days, a strange, mysterious being, aloof and alone. And this great chariot, accompanied by its attendants, and by the hosts of heaven, and by the angels and the archangels, appeared to the prophet, and after the vision had been accorded, it returned again to its own remoteness in the heavens. <coughs> Many have attempted to explain the meaning of this chariot that appeared uh, to Ezekiel. One of the most natural and proper explanations is that this strange thing with its wheels within wheels was the universe itself, that the universe indeed is a machine, a wonderful chariot, the chariot of heaven, and that in this mysterious moving universe forever thundering along its appointed ways in space was thrown the charioteer, the supreme power itself, riding upon creation as upon a chariot throne. This seemed to also suggest many other phases of Eastern thinking which contributed gradually to the integration of the structure of the Kabbalah. All these wheels were worlds. These worlds were in reasonable relationships to each other. The universe was divided into levels and planes and spheres and abodes. Some of these were divine, some of them were sidereal, some were terrestrial, and others were infernal. And the universe began to take on something of the appearance of Dante's universe a universe with its heavens and its hells, a universe the parts of which were innumerable, and all the parts inhabited by orders of creatures. And these creatures were ruled over by princes and governors and kings and rulers. And out of the good part of this universe, with all its angels and archangels, came ceremonial magic, the white magic, by means of which man was able to call upon the archangelic hosts or the angels, or the spirits of elements, the spirits of nature and of the earth, to achieve various works and purposes which he regarded as good. And it is said that God gave unto Solomon the king of Israel a ring set with four precious stones, in order that he might have dominion over the four corners of creation, and the four orders of beings that inhabited these uh, realms and places in space. It is said also that Adam, coming into birth, descended through the four great worlds, receiving in each of these worlds a certain endowment, a certain part of his compound nature. And so finally he fell into the mystery of matter after, <coughs> after having been exiled from the paradisical abode. Thus we see all of these regions and parts seem to make up a kind of machinery, a true concept of wheels within wheels, orbits within orbits, 
the orbits of luminaries surrounding their planets, the orbits of planets surrounding their sun, the orbits of suns surrounding cosmic suns, and so on forever, to form the great Merkaba, the chariot, the wonderful vehicle of the ever-living God, the vehicle that was full of eyes, which were stars, full of lights, full of mysteries and of laws, in the midst of which ruled the Ancient One, robed in white, symbolic of the supreme power of nature. Perhaps this thought also became involved in the vision of St. John on the Isle of Patmos, where he beheld the great being walking among the branches of the candlesticks. This uh, concept of the Merkaba may well have inspired a great deal of research into the cosmogony of things. It also inspired another side, a side of man seeking, and that was the analogy that if this great universe was indeed wheels within wheels, spheres within spheres, realms that could be classified and ordered, mysteries that could be heralded into patterns and designs, so the little universe, man himself, must so likewise be constructed. And man must have also the wheels within wheels within himself, and his organs, parts, faculties, and powers were regarded as the equivalents within him of the majesty of the great chariot of the law. And in the midst of this thing which man calls his body, which is really a mystery of mysteries beyond the comprehension of even the greatest scientist of today, Within this, as upon a gilded throne, rides the human spirit, guarded by the four cherubs, moving through space from an unknown origin to an unknown destiny. It is not difficult to imagine that a poetic people, living in the desert, living close to their own natural instincts, uh, should uh, meditate upon such matters, and should hit upon one after another, multitudes, of wonderful analogies, beautiful parallels, by which they were utterly convinced of the correctness of this basic assumption. And by degrees, their scholars took it over. And little by little, it branched out to form the basis of all of their arts and sciences. We find evidences of the mystery of the Merkaba and the structure of ancient Jewish music, of their theater, of their astronomy, their science, their medicine, their art. All of these branches of learning were enriched, inspired by these mystical overtones. Perhaps out of all of this came one of the fundamental principles of Kabbalism, the idea of the lawful universe. The universe which, although it originated in the divine nature, was still in, the, in itself a thing of law and order, a thing of causes and effects, an instrument working magnificently, following predestined courses throughout time and eternity, that this Merkaba or chariot of righteousness was indeed the total creation, synchronized, magnificently brought together without accident or coincidence, so that man lived in a universe magnificently organized magnificently sustained and protected by the wisdom and the courage and the strength of angels and of archangels and of mysterious spiritual beings. Out of this same Kabbalism also came demonology, that witchcraft which plagued the Dark Ages. For these same Kabbalists, in many instances, discovered analogies which led them to believe that infernal forces, the dark shadows of divine beings, inhabited the lower regions of space, forming the strange peoples of some fabulous Gehenna. These evil princes and their powers of darkness could be called forth by magic and charm and invocation, as in the ancient legend of Faust invoking Mephistopheles. Thus the universe was also full of life, life of good, life of evil, and between good and evil some way suspended man who must cope with both, must ascend from the lesser to the greater, must struggle against evil and struggle toward good by all the most powerful moral and spiritual incentives which he possessed. On and on went these interpretations. 
and other prophets followed in the ways of the first ones. And little by little the mystery of the Merkaba took upon itself a fuller and more complete interpretation. There was a belief among the Jewish mystics and even among the more orthodox peoples that there were certain persons, certain prophets, in a certain descent from Adam, who were permitted to depart from this world without knowing death, that they were picked up in righteousness, as was Enoch, and carried into the presence of God. The angel that appeared to Moses to invite him to ascend the mountain to receive the tablets of the law, told Moses to rise and follow him into the presence of God. And Moses was afraid, according to the old legends, and said that he did not dare to go, that he was not worthy to be brought into the presence of deity, and that he had no powers or faculties by which he could attain such a mystery. Whereupon the angelic being caused him to become a form of the Merkaba himself, that in some mysterious ways this wonderful chariot of righteousness was fashioned from his own substance, and in this he was allowed to ascend into the presence of the Almighty. So the Merkaba legends continue to appear, perhaps gathering some momentum in the later days of Israel, but always with something of a mystery about them, something that was a little more even than the wonderful story described in the vision of Ezekiel. Gradually we have a hint here and there that we are in the presence of a strange mystery story, the keys of which may completely elude us, but about which certain intimations can nevertheless be suspected. We are told, for example, that the mysteries of the Merkaba were mysteries not for the profane or for the young, or for those who had not attained insight. That for the average person, the mystery of the Merkaba was a terrible and tantalizing thing that could lead only to destruction, misery, and death. So the old rabbins repeatedly warned their followers not to explore the region of this strange belief, not to seek for its true meaning, lest they discover it, and by discovering it, destroy themselves. Now such warnings as this are rather interesting, especially in more modern times where greater audacity, if not better judgment, prevails. In this time and in this generation, and even for several centuries therefore, research has been rather quietly but systematically carried on among students of Jewish metaphysics to see if the threads of this story could be put together into a little better pattern. Something was accomplished. In the ancient days of Israel, there were, a very, there were very few mystics, but these were bound together into a secret order. And these secret orders were the orders of elders, chosen from among the elders, from among the wisest of Israel. These were bound by oaths and obligations and their instruction was conferred upon them with the promise of total secrecy. Even the modern Jewish uh, historian knows that these secret societies existed. And he also has dared to say that among the most important concerns of these secret orders was the Merkaba of righteousness. That in some way the whole of the esoteric doctrine of Israel centered in this mystery a mystery which even many modern Kabbalists have never heard about, and a mystery which is certainly not generally accepted or considered by modern Jews. Yet this mystery, in some way, was the very soul of the soul of the law. And this myth, there are various Mishnas bearing upon it. And out of the various philosophies and beliefs, we come to almost inevitable conclusions, conclusions which are supported from outside sources to a degree, especially from among the mystics of Islam, who are known or have had contact with this earlier doctrine. Among the Muslims, we have a very interesting legend, uh, which is part of the story of the Arabian Nights entertainment. 
And that is the story of the flying carpet. Now everyone has read the story and every once in a while it appears in some interesting cartoon or short story or fable in modern news. It's a fascinating thought and we love to remember it even as we love to remember the flying mantle of the little lame prince in one of our own fairy tales. Flying cloth, carpets and robes and garments occur in many myths and legends throughout the world. But there is a direct religious implication in the flying carpet of the Arabian Nights. For it only takes one very quick look at the old reports, one moment of thought, to realize that the, the flying carpet is the prayer rug. This is the key to the whole situation. If you have been in Muslim countries, you realize that a prayer rug and a turban are among the most important possessions of a true believer. The prayer rug is for his daily meditation, and his turban not only covers his head against the heat of the desert, but when he dies it will be his shroud, and he will be wound in its white cloth. Thus his turban is part of his religion, and so is his prayer rug. And at a certain prescribed hour when the voice comes from the minaret, the faithful spread their prayer rugs to this day and kneeling in prayer face Mecca and recite the ancient formula of their faith beginning with the words Allahu Akbar. Now the prayer rug is not out of fashion even in our day and among the laws of Saudi Arabia at the present time are that if a man in an automobile shall come upon another man upon his prayer rug it is his duty to stop and wait until the prayers are finished he may not run over the man, as would be the practice in this country, nor will he be permitted to haunt the man out of the way, which would be still further in our way of doing things. He must keep quiet, preferably pray also, certainly respect the entire situation, and if it takes two hours, wait patiently. Because some men, of course, seem to have more to pray to, others more to pray about, and still others more to ask forgiveness for. So that... Uh, it is not just certain how long this prayer will take. But you will respect it. Now in this prayer rug, what happens? When the Muslim spreads this rug, kneels upon it, it is a symbol that he has departed from this world. The prayer rug is not only a, a rug, the prayer rug is the symbol of the mosque. It is the symbol of the holy place. And whenever a man is upon his prayer rug, he is no longer in this world at all. He is in a world in which he faces God and God alone. There is no longer any merchandising, no longer any ties of the flesh, no longer any outside concerns whatever. He is just as much on holy ground when he kneels upon his prayer rug as he would be even if he was kneeling upon the warm pavement of Mecca. This is holiness. This is separation from all things mortal. This is departure from the flesh. And as he values his immortal soul, the Muslim will cause a wall to be built around the borders of his rug. And out from the world nothing shall enter into that place. And while he is there, no thought of his shall turn to the world. He is alone, even though he be in a marketplace with ten thousand of his kind. In that moment, he and God only exist. Now this is a very important concept because we find also among the Brotherhood of Basra, one of the great esoteric orders of the Muslims, that the prayer rug became the symbol of a lodge or a gathering place of secret orders. It was so also employed in some instances by the Druzes. For if a Druze could not attend the lodge of his order, he could be present by being upon his rug. For in that moment he joined his brethren wherever they might be throughout the world. As he stepped on to the rug, he stepped into eternity. Therefore, while of course many Muslims, no doubt, lack all this mystical overtone, it is still part of their faith and part of their orthodoxy part of their most sincere belief. And it is a magic carpet because it carries them in an instant 
from wherever they may be to the very footstool of the eternal. On their rugs they can go to all parts of the spiritual universe. Their minds can contemplate upon all mysteries. They can be lifted up from the commonplace to the eternal and the inevitable. This is indeed a magic carpet, because it takes man out of this world into another world beyond. Now there's no doubt in the world that the magic carpet of the Muslim it has its origin in the Merkaba of the Kabbalah. This Merkaba, therefore, or the chariot of ecstasy, was the mysterious vehicle by which the consciousness of the devout Jewish mystic was carried from one region of space to another, ascending to the very footstool of the divine, even as Muhammad is said to have made his night journey upon the lightning flash, the strange monster called Al-Barak. In the twinkling of an eye, the prayer rug carries us throughout space. In the instant of instance, the Merkaba, as the chariot of ecstasy, carries the true believer out of the profane, out of the commonplace, into the strange world of divine realities. Now it is obvious that uh, there is no really no such a kind of vehicle that corresponds either with the prayer rug or with the Merkaba. Certainly, to all but himself, the Muslim is right where he was when he started. Certainly, uh, there is no indication that he departed into some mysterious realm of abstract space. Therefore, the prayer rug was in a measure a symbol of departure into withinness. It was the retiring of the soul into its own eternity. On the assumption that as man went inward into himself, he also moved outward into space, and that as he found the core of his own being within himself, so he found in that same flash of enlightenment the core being at the root of all existence. The Merkava, then, must be a symbol of something like the prayer rug. And, of course, the uh, mystic um, in Islam, the simple mystic, tells you that it represents only this one thing the concentration of the mind, the internalizing of consciousness, the mysterious power to blot out the irrelevant and the irreverent, and to come back into the inward abode, the secret garden of the heart. Here all the wonders of magic and mystery unfold in the soul of the believer. This again does not go very far. But it is one step towards something. And I think it is also one step toward the understanding of the Merkaba of righteousness. When we think of a vehicle, when we think of some kind of an instrument by which something can be accomplished, we are also inclined to use the term to cover the concept of a method, a means, a way. This instrument, the Merkaba, therefore, is not only a chariot, but it is a method. It is a kind of instrument <coughs> by means of which miracles can be wrought. The Sufi has the same idea exactly about his prayer rug. We are moving on parallel incidents entirely. The rug itself is very often strangely designed and ornamented. One of the most common forms of ornamentation being that the design represents the open gate of a mosque. This open gate of a mosque represents an opening between worlds. It represents a door, like the gateless gate of Zen, which leads from the objective to the subjective. The same is true of the Merkaba. It is not only full of wheels and eyes, but it is also full of roads, of strange paths, the 32 paths of Safayat Zira. It is uh, full of uh, winding ways that lead through the 49 mysteries of existence to the final 50th mystery which is locked in the heart of the infinite. So that in this idea of the chariot, we also have a proper term or thought 
for a peculiar way of doing things. In other words, the chariot became the true symbol of the secret doctrine of Israel because it was the figure used to conceal what I have decided to call Jewish yoga. <coughs> now there will be a lot of people, probably a good many Jewish people, who will think that this is rather far-fetched. But let us see whether it is far-fetched or not. Is there any people known in this world that has not, in the attainment of culture, developed a discipline of insight? Is there any civilized nation that has not had its mysteries, that has not had its secret disciplines for the de development of contemplative life? Is there any people that have not had rules and regulations that were for the few? Even as it is said in the sacred scriptures that the Sod is for the Hasidim. Is it not true that the mysteries of God are for those who have sought them out or have been initiated into the rites, who have become those in whose heart, as the old work says, the fear of the Lord hath brought righteousness. Therefore can we not pretty well assume that as we know this art existed in Egypt at the time of Moses, as we know it existed in India before the time of Moses, as we know that it has existed in the Near East ever since the contact between Islam and the Semitic tribes, is there any reason to doubt that somewhere in this strange complex of beliefs there must have been the Near Eastern and Syrian equivalent of the common belief of all Eastern peoples? Is there also not some reason to point out that all of these allegories and legends and stories about prophets who after certain means and methods were picked up and carried into the divine presence. Is there any way in which we can doubt that these journeys implied what we might term today religious ecstasy? That these journeys were not physical any more than they are physical in the case of the axis of the dervishes. These experiences uh, do not mean that a person has in the flesh departed into some other region, but that the true flesh, which is the spirit, has been raised up and the body has been left behind. This point is clearly made in connection with the apocryphal account of, Mo of Mohammed and his night journey to heaven. It is reported that while Mohammed himself, standing upon the rock Moriah in Jerusalem, took hold of the lower rungs of the ladder of silken cords that descended from heaven, and slowly ascended through the seven gates, that while this was happening, the prophet himself was asleep at Medina, and was there seen by many persons. Uh, Muhammad never declared that he had been in Jerusalem in the flesh, but rather that he had been carried there upon a mysterious steed composed of seven animals, al which again represents to most esoteric students, a symbol of a secret methodology, the magic of conscious pro projection, the mystery of controlling the relationship between the body and the consciousness. It would appear from all that we can study, even on Monasticism, Neoplatonism, and even Pythagoreanism and Platonism in their proper forms, that a religion by means of which there is no esoteric achievement possible, cannot long endure. A religion of theory alone, a religion which does not advance step by step until it ends in the spiritual experience of the presence of God, cannot truly be a great religion or an enduring one. Now the old Jewish writers themselves have loaded this subject with warnings that only the pure of heart 
Only those most dedicated, only those most wise, only those most courageous must approach the mystery of the Merkaba. This is exactly the recommendation and warning that is given to the students of Yoga and Vedanta. This is the ancient burden of testimony of the Kala Chakra and the great tantric schools of India. Only those who are pure of heart may see God. Only those in whom a great achievement of spiritual integrity has already been accomplished must mispractice the mysteries of the Merkaba. For all others, this will lead to self-destruction, which is more, no more nor less, than an actual statement of the warnings attendant upon the practice of esoteric disciplines. I think we can, without question, particularly by reference to the Kabbalah, and its meditative principles come to the conclusion that the Jewish mystics were perfectly aware of what we may term yogic practice. That under one way or another, under one name or another, uh, they were conscious of this mysterious constitution of man with its mysterious uh, gangliated structure by means of which through meditation uh, the consciousness of the individual could gradually be extricated from the complex of matter and be capable of an experience or existence in itself, attended by those extensions of faculties which may normally be expected under such conditions. The visions of the Jewish prophets and seers all tell this same story, and all would indicate definitely that the so-called anointing of the prophet also included an instruction in which a predecessor accepted this prophet into his own life, conveyed to him the mystery of the Merkaba, which is the same mystery that was transmitted in medieval times to the alchemists under the mysterious formulas of chemistry. Therefore, that the actual secret doctrine in Israel is the same as in any other part of the world, a doctrine relating that the, to the power of lifting up man as a spiritual being and giving him the internal experience of unity with divine truth. Uh, as we go on examining the various writings and so on, we cannot but feel that this is very clearly intimated. And this brings us to another phase of our problem, which I think also has a direct bearing upon this. <coughs> namely what we may know about meditational and prayerful doctrines among the Jewish people. We know, for example, that in antiquity it was common to divide knowledge, either into two sections or into three. Most anciently the division was twofold, what might be termed the outer knowledge and the inner knowledge. <coughs> and a later <clears throat> in a later time, the knowledge was considered as threefold, consisting of an outer knowledge, an intermediate knowledge, and an inner knowledge. The outer knowledge in Israel was called the Torah. Uh, the intermediate knowledge was called the Mishnah. The inner knowledge was called the Kabbalah. And the Torah was said to be the body of the law, the Mishnah, the soul of the law, the Kabbalah, the spirit of the law. These three parts of knowledge were matters of interpretation, and there can be no doubt that the intention was to imply, as in all ancient secret orders, that those who attained to the highest degree of these orders attained to some practical achievement. They were not merely individuals who could read a little better or could argue a little more adroitly. The entire purpose of initiation into secret orders was always the same namely the attainment of an increase of consciousness, a deeper insight into life and its mysteries, an insight that could only uh, be strengthened by some kind of meditational discipline. Here we come to a common fact, which we know today as well as any other nation could have known it namely that the development of the internal is always a scientific process. It is always a matter 
of gradually cultivating values. It can only come through one mastering step by step the disciplines of meditation and realization. Consequently, if these old mysteries had any meaning at all, they must have meant a formula, a rite, a process, a procedure for soul cultivation. A procedure that was formal and not incidental, not merely part of the be goodness which was given to the people, but a part of a be betterness that was reserved for a few, and by that few was held to be sacred and not to be communicated to, uh, to any who had not passed through certain probationships and certain uh, earlier developments. This concept was gradually incorporated into the structure of Jewish religion, although the details are not always available. We know that in the tabernacle in the wilderness, the three parts or rooms were clearly indicated. The courtyard for the gathering of the peoples, the holy place for the gathering and communion of the priests, the holy of holies, the sanctuary in which only the high priest of Israel himself might enter, and only after he had removed the garments of glory, and had entered into the presence of the Lord who dwelt between the wings of the angels or cherubs upon the mercy seat, and was present in the form of the mysterious Merkava again, the mysterious presence or power of deity. <coughs> In this sense, therefore, the, the ark was the Merkava, for in it the angelic power uh, united with earth in the proving of the mystery of life. When the temple of Solomon the king was built upon the rocky crest of Moriah, there was placed upon the doors of the everlasting house figures of cherubs, guardians, holding the flaming swords, and these were the keepers of the sanctuary. And only when Solomon called upon the name of his father David did the Lord open the doors of the sanctuary of Israel. These cherubs guarding the ancient way certainly represented some power guarding something of meaning, import, or significance. The very way of the temple itself was the way of personal growth and development. Maimonides tells us something of this, but uh, not too clearly because he was bound very closely by the orthodoxies of his faith. But he does assure us of the meditational disciplines of his people. He does assure us that these people practiced spiritual arts that they sought their father in prayer and quietude, uh, that they performed not only the common rituals of their faith, but if they were devout, they retired into their closets and there besought in secret the mystery of heaven and the intercession of the divine powers. And in their experiences of this kind, they explored the universe. <coughs> but even more where disciplines are adequate and where disciplines carry on the entire procedure. The Kabbalah as a structure has been of grave importance among Jewish people. Most peoples have feared it. They have wondered what it meant. <coughs> but they have felt that there was something strange, dangerous about it. But as we go into it, I would be quite certain that the entire structure of the Kabbalah, especially as it is given in the Sefer HaZohar, is a veiled statement of yogic discipline. That each of the sections and parts of it have to do with some part of the secret doctrine of human regeneration. Now, the process represented by the Merkaba must be considered as twofold. First, it is this personal, immediate discipline of religion, for it is absolutely essential to the religion of man that man experience religion, not that he merely listens while others talk about it. And at the core of every faith is an experience of faith, which must be cultivated, must be engendered, must be in some way made available to the believer. There is also, however, 
what might be termed the long-range program of religion. Religion is not completely fulfilled merely in the religious experience of the person. This is especially true, true among the Jewish people who have a very strong sense of common salvation. Salvation not for the Jew but for Israel. And therefore that there must be a communal salvation in which all peoples working together must be lifted up together into the final state of blessedness. There is no question in the world also that while this subject is again a mystery, that the belief in metempsychosis or reincarnation did sustain the secret sects of Israel. Therefore that they had as in Asia the concept of a long enduring process of self-improvement, the gradual overcoming of the world. They also recognized, as all mystics have, that the mystical experience is only a symbol, an intensified symbol of a process that must take place in society for the ultimate regeneration of all living things. That which comes to the mystic for a moment, in his trance or his ecstasy, represents the presence of faculties that must ultimately be so completely trained and disciplined and revealed that the whole world and all knowledge and all peoples will share in the same experience. Not only sharing in it for a moment, but sharing in it forever by the ultimate development of the faculties which produce it. Thus in the Kabbalah we have the immediate experience of truth and we have the remote experience of the regeneration of all mankind. We have the concept that not only must the individual find this salvation for himself, but that it is part of a system which reveals within him and within all human beings the instrument necessary for this final perfection of man. So the Kabbalah actually does teach that within the nature and constitution of Adam, even though he be in a relapsed state, there is still the whole mystery of heaven, that the mystery of heaven is locked in him that it was not taken from him, but closed within him. That as he fell into material condition, those parts of his nature which were divine were obscured, drugged, made heavy and laden, as in the Greek philosophy. But that these mysteries were not taken away, they were merely submerged, like some strange ancient land submerged beneath the depths of the ocean. Thus man coming into mortal existence was still the divine being he had always been, but his divinity was hidden as wings under a shell. And he was therefore born into this world, a uh, few of days and full of troubles. Yet within him always was the presence of a divine power, and more than this, the presence of a divine plan. And that the perfection of man is as inevitable as any other process in nature. For a time, this inevitable unfoldment, evolution, or release of man is carried on by nature. This process continues until there arises in man the mysterious complex which we call intellect. Gradually, as man passes through certain stages of evolution, he becomes a self-thinking creature. He becomes a being capable of reasoning power. He also becomes a being capable of self-understanding and self-analysis. As this change uh, takes place within his nature, it does not change the laws under which he exists. He must still grow through space as he has always grown, step by step in the fulfillment of every truth and principle which is part of his own being or of the universe in which he exists. It is, however, given to man as the Mishnah also tells us, that at certain time that he takes hold upon his own destiny, that he is no longer a creature led in darkness, he is a self-leading creature. And at this time a certain limited determinism, as Aquinas calls it, is conferred upon him. Man is now privileged to choose whether he shall consciously take upon himself the work of salvation, or whether he shall ignore this, continue in the furtherance of his own personal and private enterprises, and wait for nature to perfect the work. Most persons choose the latter course, 
and as a result of that they are under a constant difficulty while nature is perfecting the work. Instead of cooperating, they are forced. They are driven by circumstances. They find their false interests and false projects collapse about them. They find that their selfishness brings only a measure of misery, sickness, and despair. <coughs> Yet they are continuing it on their own way because they have the innate power to do so. There are others, however, that in time come to the conclusion uh, that a conscious cooperation with the laws of growth and progress will simplify existence. Therefore, that there comes a time when man becoming a self-directing creature comes into the desperate need of insight. It is not enough merely to have the power to do as you please. The most important of the thing is to know what you should do, what you should please to be or to have or to attain. And as this situation arises usually in the life of the individual when he is not fully certain of these matters, he is thereby confronted with a mystery. He is confronted by an urge, a desire, an impulse, or an instinct to be better than he is without the skill to know how to achieve this end. He has not the experience which only life itself can bestow. He cannot know the ways of meditation because he has not experienced them, yet he desires to establish them in himself. He does not know the will of God for the creature, but he knows that he wishes to obey that will. Obedience without insight is a very difficult and treacherous thing. Consequently, a conscious cooperation with the universal plan implies the need for some way of increasing insight, some way of discovering the nature of that plan. Of course, under those conditions, the first thing that the religiously minded person might do is turn to his holy scriptures. He will turn to his sacred book, for there he will discover that he is again in difficulty. His own insight may not be sufficient to enable him to interpret the symbols, which were arbitrarily and curiously confused on purpose. The outer structure of the text will not suffice him. He is still, therefore, in a state of confusion. And in this state, of course, he then journeyed to the celebrated teachers and the rabbins and the learned and the wise, seeking from them the secret of this process within himself. Perhaps he found out the answer, perhaps he did not. But in most cases, if we go to Eastern philosophy for a parallel, he came ultimately to advice. He came ultimately to someone who had walked the way, and therefore who could instruct or inspire him in the manner in which he should proceed. If, however, this advice, this help, this presence was denied or not available, the Kabbalah tells us that it is not absolutely necessary. For if this person, as one Kabbalist points out, was cast away upon a desert island, without a book, without another human being, yet earnestly and completely in his own heart, desired this knowledge, it could not be concealed from him. It would reach him in some way, usually through some internal experience of himself. So assuming for the moment that the outside teacher is not available, which is the common case in mysticism today, by the way, uh, then the question arises, how shall it be achieved? <coughs> the answer is that there is a certain witnessing which precedes these disciplines, by which there is a consecration of self, a simple statement of resolution, and the person following the practice of Apollonius of Tyana, the self-disciplined Pythagorean, simply says, I will practice certain principles, such as I know to be basically right, even though they are not adequate. I will prayerfully, quietly, lovingly, wisely carry forth this resolution in my life. The first step, therefore, as the Kabbalah points out, is the foundation in, wor in worthiness. This is within the reach of every person. This is merely the gradual living of a true life, a life dedicated to the best of the outer structure of our faith, 
A life lived in harmony with the commandments. A life lived in harmony with the Sermon on the Mount. A life lived as near as we can live it in the true spirit of religion. This does not necessarily have anything to do with attending religious organizations. It is a personal conduct. It is a person living his principles because in his heart he believes them to be right and refusing to compromise these principles because he realizes and is convinced in his own soul that these principles come from God. Therefore, of all things, they must not and cannot be compromised. Now, the ancients say that this is like going alone into the wilderness. The individual goes forth into a world that will not understand him, will probably to a measure persecute him as it has the prophets who went before him, a world in which many things which other people seem to find enjoyable through compromise, through failure to live principles, will be denied to him. Therefore, he is under a constant testing, a trial, a, a kind of initiation which he has imposed upon himself. If he is a fanatic, he fails. If he attempts more than he can achieve, he fails. If he hastens too rapidly over ground that he has not learned to walk, he will also fail. But if without ambition, without pride, without ulterior motive of any kind, without desire to excel, and according to the ancient mystical traditions, without even the desire to be known by God or to know of God, but simply because he inwardly believes this way of life is right. If impelled by no other consideration than this, he achieves the meditative existence and becomes one appointed, anointed, set apart by his own dedication. Then it is believed and taught that as it occurred to Ezekiel, at the moment in which his own readiness is found, at a time which only God knoweth, the mystery of the Merkava will be revealed. The heavens will open, and the secrets of the esoteric arts will be inwardly and intuitively known. Therefore, that it is not necessary for them to be communicated. It is only necessary that they be merited in a true, a complete, and adequate way. Now, this revelation comes not in a single night or in a single hour or day, but consists of a gradual enrichment of the faculties and powers of the individual. He is simply growing more rapidly than his time. He is achieving in himself a, an increased tempo of evolution. He is growing in a rate which will cause him to be uh, nearer to the goal of evolution than those around him. And in this process of personal, consecrated, intentional growth, he will also enjoy gradually the development of those faculties and powers which evolution has impelled all persons to expect and to know. These powers exist in man. Some persons will receive them a thousand years from now, some nations ten thousand years from now. But to the individual who merits them by the anticipation of the qualities and practices related to them, they may be more immediately available. Thus the powers of the seer are not a unique, unnatural group of powers. They are merely faculties that all men will possess in the fullness of time. But because the seer has dedicated himself, has anticipated time, has grown more rapidly than the common demand, he achieves ends which in his own day appear miraculous, but which will be sustained and justified in future ages. As he perceives, therefore, the heavens open to him by degrees. All advancement is by degrees. And this advancement carries with it the next step of itself. And from these first experiences and experiments, the individual gradually unfolds within himself the latent powers of the method. Now, why does it happen, for example, that these yogic disciplines can unfold in him this way? Simply because yoga in itself is nothing but another expression of universal law. Therefore, yoga is to a certain phase of man's life what growth is to a plant. 
It is natural. It is inevitable. It may be acquired in a certain way <coughs> for partial purposes uh, by certain association, by initiation, by communion. But if these things are absent and the universe is honest, it must be that while it may be happy, convenient, and pleasant for the chela to sit at the feet of his guru and in this way gain enlightenment, it must also be that the disciple, if ready, must attain this enlightenment if there be no guru. It is only the power of the teacher to help and direct a situation. Parents do not cause their children to grow, but they may be present to help them in the process of growing. Uh, parents do not cause their children to increase in stature or to mature from one age to another, but they are present to assist in these procedures. Growth is from within. Care and attention may be bestowed by love and friendship. In the same way in the secret arts, the unfoldment of the doctrine is from within, and all that any teacher can do is to try to help the individual to unfold himself. If this individual is already unfolding according to the law, the various steps and disciplines of the sacred arts will be made known to him by the very processes of his own consciousness. Thus, as he needs, the need will be supplied, because this need is nothing more than a further unfolding of principles that are immutable within the disciple himself. So if in some nations... Uh, these practices are called yogic, and in another group of peoples they have no name at all. This has nothing to do with their efficacy, in fact. The Chinese Taoists practice them one way, the uh, Japanese Buddhist another. The Zen tries to cut through them all with strange doctrines. They were parts of the wisdom of Persia and of Greece. They were known to Pythagoras and Plato. They have been always part of the wisdom of Islam and Arabia and they have always been present in the mystical speculations of the Jewish people. Only some did not name them at all. Some only regarded them as a natural, slow, quiet walking towards infinity. Others made them quite complicated by term and symbol. Some attempted more assiduously than others to communicate them. Some simply experienced them, like the dervish mystic Jalaluddin. But named or nameless, growth is simply an unfoldment of natural processes. The unfoldment of mysticism from within the self. And all that man can do to achieve this growth is to prepare his own nature so that such growth is possible. This is done by achieving by intention such refinement of structure and attitude as would normally be bestowed by nature over a long period of time. If the disciple then achieves this readiness, as Hermes said, the master is here. And this master may come in the form of a person to help us, or may come in the quietude of our own inner life as a great insight, as a great experience, <coughs> as a communion with the Most High, about which we may even have a very scattered and insecure comprehension. Now as we go further into this problem again, let's drop back for a moment and study the uh, parallels between the Sufis and the Jewish people on some of these problems. Perhaps some of you have seen one of the old Sufi der dervish mystics <coughs> in his own country. Perhaps you have noticed that some of them carry in their hands a peculiar kind of staff which has seven knots upon it. These knots are almost like the knots of, or breaks upon the branch of a bamboo. But the seven divisions are very carefully marked. There is no doubt in the world that these seven do represent the seven steps of yoga. There is no question in the world that the do Sufi or Dervish sitting on his rug with one hand or arm supported by a peculiar stick to sustain his arm, the other hand quietly in his lap, while his eyes half closed like some Buddhist image, he is meditating upon the mysteries of the infinite. These experienced uh, teachers and mystics 
have always believed that by the power of their inner doctrine they could journey to assemblies of their own kind. It is believed that these mystics project themselves at the time of the Feast of Ramadan and join in a holy and sacred ceremony on the roof of the Kaaba at Mecca. These mystics traverse the whole world according to their own teachings, journeying here and there in the spirit alone. They possess the power, if they so will, to project an image of themselves that may be visible for a time. Then they vanish again, like the strange magicians of the Arabian Nights. The people of Islam today fully believe that these things are so, just as a great many uh, Indian mystics, even in this rather materialistic and transitional period, are quite certain of the essential principles of their yogic teaching. Also we know from more recent researchers that yoga actually does have a physiological effect upon man that it is positively true and beyond doubt <coughs> that the body is affected by these disciplines, that they can be used in correcting a great many physical problems of health, although this perhaps is their least importance. They can be used in controlling and directing the attitudes of the mind. They can be used in controlling and subduing the emotions. They can be used in the development and strengthening of extrasensory faculties and perceptions. These things have been the common knowledge of Asia for thousands of years. We have yet to disprove it, and what small painful research we have made sustains rather than disproves this old belief and tradition. We are coming gradually here in the Western world today to a rather critical period in our own religious life. Perhaps the average person of today, more than at any other time in history, is completely isolated from what you might term a true mysticism. We have a certain amount, amount of mystical or metaphysical organization. We have people who are sincere and devout seekers after mystical truth. But this strange world of mysticism that was known to our ancestors is strangely obscured for us today. For the most part, Western man is without resources in spiritual experience. His religion consists merely of conformities, acceptances, and, as far as he is able to indulge them, certain integrities of conduct. Now these are important, let's not minimize them. But these in themselves are no more than a moral code. And what man has today in his religion in the West is little more than a moral code. A moral code perhaps somewhat uh, dignified by a circumstance of prayer. Even prayer, however, to Western man is a very difficult, distant and uncertain uh, ritual. Prayer is very highly formalized in the West. Or if it is not formalized, it is taken as a strangely literal thing, and most of its overtones and mysticisms are lost. We approach religion too much today as we would approach business or law or medicine or anything of that nature as a kind of study, a subject perhaps more meritorious than the rest, a series of beliefs that certainly the young should enjoy and know. But some way religion has lost its dead dimension. And I think we could say rather safely that since the foundation of the Western Hemisphere there has been very little religion in the Western continent that has dead penetration. Some perhaps a little more than others, but the whole trend of religion in the West has been towards the recognition of a kind of religious formula, a formula of acceptances and rejections, a formula sac uh, sanctified by sacraments themselves not generally understood, by which a person experiences the fact of being saved or not being saved much as at an evangelical meeting. These dimensions are not adequate to a religious life. All religion must be grounded in the availability of the personal experience of God. All religion must truly be a means of approaching a higher state of consciousness. It must be an enrichment of our power to know, not merely our strength to believe. Religion must go somewhere. 
Religion must be something more than that which we take with us to the grave to help us to make a transition. Religion is not consolation in the last hours of life. Religion is a perpetual experience, an experience which belongs to all worlds and all spheres, and which we must carry with us out of this world as we brought it with us into this world. To get this higher concept of religion, there is only one possible way of approaching it, and that is to recognize that religion is a sacred science, that religion is a method anciently established by means of which man may attain maturity of consciousness. Unless we have this concept, our religions become very little in the terms of true solution. Uh, they become faiths we can change every weekend. They become beliefs in which we can share without being impelled to any particular change of attitude. They can be the kinds of religions which we take with us to war instead of using to maintain the peace. So in this entire mystery, the only possible solution to a religion is its depth dimension. Almost all known ancient religions, even those of primitive peoples, have this depth dimension. It is obvious from all of their sacred writings that the Jewish people had this depth dimension. But that like all other people, including ourselves, all did not favor it or know about it or practice it. This is not so important. It isn't important to the dervish uh, that his religion uh, has this depth dimension except in the sense that it is there when he is ready. <laughs> he may not be ready. He does not demand that others practice it or, or that he practice it himself, but he knows it is there. And it is the knowing of the thereness of it that gives the religion its tremendous authority. If man in the West knew as an experience of true belief that behind his religion there is an inevitable, immutable, and absolute discipline of personal reunion with deity, that this is the substance of his religion, and that the disciplines of his religion unfold his consciousness toward the availability of truth. And if he really believed this, that his religion was this ancient way anciently known to all people, leading from ignorance to reality, that it had a dimension that science, art, literature, philosophy can never have. And that dimension is that religion leads to the personal experience of God. That this experience is an absolute scientific fact that the only reason why it is not available to all is because all will not take the necessary effort or train themselves for it. This is not important. It is no, there is no demand that everyone does it. The only demand is that it can be done. And the secrets of how it can be done, and the circumstances associated with the doing, these become parts of the secret doctrine of the people, whether it be of Israel or of Asia. That there be such secret doctrine is essential. The fact that we are in such religious trouble today is that we do not believe this. We not only are not practicing what we actually claim, but we do not believe there is anything beyond a simple... Um, more or less sincere effort to try to be good. We're not even sure what good is. And we're not at all certain that we're making much of a try. And most people in the privacy of their own lives will admit they're not trying very hard. But there is also a reason why we do not try. Why should we work desperately after something that as far as we know has no substance in itself? So we try very hard. And if we try hard enough, someday we may go to heaven, if there is a heaven. 
This is not the stuff of a great spiritual integrity. But if we realize that our faith is a kind of gate, like that of the door of the mosque found upon the prayer wheel of the prayer flag of the Muslim, that our religion is the open door to infinity, that it is real, that it contains all the levels necessary to satisfy the needs of people, that for the child it is milk, and for the man it is meat. For those of various perceptions, it is what they perceive. To the artist it is art, to the musician it is music. But beyond and above all these things, religion is the royal road that leads inevitably to realization. That this realization is the purpose of life, the royal end towards which all things achieve, and that the secret methods by means of which this achievement is possible are truly the magical instruments, the great machines, the chariot of righteousness. If we can sense this, make it a vital part of life, we will cease to speculate about religion, and we will get over this interminable problem as what is tolerance and what is intolerance. There is no question as to who is right. There is no question as to who is wrong. Theories add or detract but little. The problem is that there are laws by which man grows in grace. He keeps these laws and grows, or he breaks these laws and he does not grow. All theories have no effect, no meaning, no essential significance whatsoever. Now, because the principles of yoga are merely a phase of universal procedure captured in a diagram or a symbol. So actually, what we term yoga in relating to India, and that is only a national name for it. We do not become Hindus by practicing yoga. We do not become members of any religion by obeying the law of existence. But if we obey, we should be members in good standing of any faith that is honorable. There is no question as to this fact. And in most instances we will find it to be true. When traveling among peoples of other faiths, I have found it to be true. But the principle of self-development by discipline is archetypal. It is part of the subconsciousness of humanity. Just as surely as religion is an instinct in them, and not an institution created by them. So in truth, the laws governing the perfection of man are known in the interior consciousness of himself. They are subconscious to his own nature. He knows that at certain periods in his religious life he will be as a child, growing and receiving instruction. He knows also that at certain periods of his religious life he will become as a man, and will take upon himself the control of his own spiritual destiny under God that he may have various ways of developing this destiny. That this destiny does not mean that he has to go out and wander in the wilderness, nor neglect the problems of life, nor shirk responsibilities, nor run away from the common duties of the day. The true practice of religion consists of this acceptance of a methodology, and the recognition that the detail of this method will unfold as an experience of consciousness as necessary. Therefore, that it is not to be falsely cultivated, and when it comes naturally and properly it brings no doubts, no questions, no uncertainties, and no dangers. When it is falsely cultivated, or prematurely attempted, or forced by intellectual means alone, it can be of the greatest menace and danger and problem to the human being. So what we know as this process of human regeneration is nothing more or less than human evolution. It is evolution hastened by effort, by will, discipline, and dedication. And this is, again, an interesting parallel to the wheels of Ezekiel, because according to the old writers, these wheels represented uh, the great wheels or structures of cosmic law. 
Therefore, the chariot that carries the soul to conscious identity with God is the chariot of universal law itself. <coughs> it is not something different. It is not a magical thing. It is law, perfect, perfecting all things by its own nature. Everything that happens is lawful. Every effect follows its cause. Every principle works out according to its own principles. Therefore, the achievement of the Merkava, or the achievement of righteousness, is itself the outworking of a cause. This cause in man is dedication. This is consecration. This is realization. This is incentive, the determination to attempt the mystery of the advancement of the human psychic entity. Now today we have a great deal of discussion of psychic entity. We know that within each of us is an untutored soul. We know it is untutored by the way it, con it conducts itself. We also know that it is untutored and uncivilized by the difficulty we have getting along with it. We also realize that it is irrational because it does not lead us to rationality, but rather leads us to the uh, counselor's couch instead, which is not really the noble end of the soul. We also suspect that this soul has laws, principles, and rules. That this soul, like the great mother of mysteries herself, is a creature loving truth, seeking reality, fulfilling its own divine destiny, for all things of themselves follow God. Why then do we have this trouble? Because the soul is itself neglected, because its energies have been perverted, because we have used its faculties for purposes inferior to its own nature, and like the blinded Samson we have bound it to the millstone of our Philistine uh, interests. There is therefore only this point to bear in mind. The soul itself, which is the proper subject of yoga, is an entity waiting to be civilized, waiting to be moved along the path of evolution to its own maturity. It is not going to be uh, made well by dopes and drugs. It is not going to be uh, made to mature merely by being occasionally ventilated. There are times in which a strong laxative will help, but you cannot purge the soul forever. Therefore, what we need is the realization of the laws governing soul, and the courage to keep these laws. And these laws are part of yoga, for it is indeed the very end of yoga that the being in the body shall attain its maturity that it is this being within the body which in turn must finally approach the eternal. So there are disciplines all the way along. We have to teach children to walk. We have to teach men to think. We have to teach souls to grow. All these things are part of the natural duties of realization and association. It was the opinion of the old rabbis, therefore, that the great heritage of Israel was the law, that this law was the revelation of God for his creatures. This was the very foundation of all things. It was a little different in Israel in old days than it is now in other countries. <coughs> Perhaps the Muslim world comes the nearest today, perhaps the Hindu, but there are still uh, changes even in these approaches to belief. But in Israel, the law was the whole of the law. The law was the basis of every factor in life. Life moved from a religious conviction. Medicine was practiced according to religion. Legal matters were settled according to religion. The problem of crops and the division of the land, of profits on goods, of barter and exchange, all of these things were religion. There was nothing apart from religion. Religion had to do with the water supply, with the carrying of food across the desert, with the caravans and the camel routes. It had to do with the date palms and the rocky land where the black tents had to be spread at night. Everything was religion. 
Consequently, there was no, uh, we might say, profanity in the concept of this people. They did not always keep their faith, and for their weaknesses God was forever chastising them through the entire Old Testament. But at the same time, there was still promise in the prophets that God would forgive. It is the same in a sense today. Everything that we have around us, everything that we do, is essentially religious. Yet we have come to divide religion from practice, assuming that when we talk about God, it is religion. When we talk about practical matters, it is commerce or economics. And there is very little in common between the codes applied to these different fields of specialization. Actually, therefore, in Israel, when you talked about happiness, you talked about religion. When you talked about health, growth, and veneration for the aged, when you talked about the hope of the people, the coming of the Messiah, the golden age we looked for, when peace would come to Israel, and the wounds of the tribe should be mended, and when the temple of Herod again would stand up on the sacred hill, these things were religion, and they made up the whole life of the people. Therefore, it is not unusual or impossible or unreasonable that religion meaning so much would have to begin to some mean even more. So where all men were by nature religious, then the outstanding person had to be outstandingly religious. And in this sense of the word, you come into his esoteric teaching. You come into the disciplines which he practiced, the ancient rules and rites which he followed. <laughs> the magical arts <coughs> with which he was accomplished. All these things went deeper and deeper. But in the very deepest part of all, in the veneration of the people, was the man who could talk to God, the man who could speak face to face with the angels, and who could reveal the will of God as Jonah revealed the will of God to his people. These prophets of the Lord, who in the silence of their mysticism, received the impressions which were to rule Israel. These were the most valued and hallowed of all men. And before them even the kings of Israel must bow and acknowledge the greatness of their ways. So in this way, uh, the esoteric doctrine in Israel came to bear fruit, although the tree upon which the fruit grew was never very clearly defined. The mystic, the clairvoyant, the sage, the saint, the individual who transcended death, the person who rose from the grave, who vanished and appeared in other places, all of these things are referred to in the scriptures. We know not who the strange uh, master of mysteries was. We know as Melchizedek, king of Salem. We do not know who the mysterious angel was that wrestled with Jacob. But we know that in these early things, mysticism and physical things blended together out of a strange mingling of the magical and the commonplace. Wherever such reports exist, wherever such fables are perpetuated, we know that the old mysticism was in operation. And the story of this mysticism as the instrument for the carrying of human consciousness from this world to eternity, and perhaps back again, to bring warning to the people. This machinery, this magic, this power, this merkava of ecstasy, was almost certainly and beyond question what we call yoga, the secret doctrine of Asia, restored or reappearing to us again in the sod of Israel, in the assembly, in the secret teachings, among the mystics, uh, such as the Jaranites, and the Thessenes, and the Therapeutae, and the Nazarenes, and the Gebers, and all these strange sects who practice strange mysteries. And these strange mysteries, which later did descend into the early years of the Church, had to do with this secret art of salvation, which has been present in the religions of all people. Time's up, I think.